This video is about the Rydberg versus the Balmer equation. I've got many comments on my Rydberg videos over the years of really good questions about why I'm doing something in particular or especially why I'm using Rydberg versus Balmer. So I want to address some of those concerns today because when you see one of my videos, it's just a snapshot of the breadth of what students in my class are seeing. So when you watch a video, you might not get the overall picture and have more questions about what the heck am I doing <laughs> when I'm doing my calculations. So let me just give you my overall theme that I want to try to uh, demonstrate to you today, my mindset, which is I use the Rydberg because that equation is consistently the same uh, regardless of what I'm doing. And I'll demonstrate that over the video and go over some other questions that I get as well about these types of calculations. And just to say as an overview as well, I don't care what equation you use. It's totally fine if you use something different than me. I'm just using these equations, and the Rydberg is specifically the one you see up here. And I want to show one you. common question I get is, why does my Rydberg constant look different than your Rydberg constant? And uh, that can be seen, and you probably see one of yours up here, depending on the form that your textbook or instructor uses. But you can see, depending on how you write the Rydberg equation, you have different forms of the constant, which we people generically uh, refer to as the Rydberg constant. Okay, But it can take different forms. Uh, just so you know, and you can see it has different units when it's interconverted. It doesn't matter if you're using the Rydberg equation or the model. Another common equation. question I get is which is greater, the n initial or the n final? Because you might have learned something in your class that might be different from what you see me doing. Well, uh, it might, here's how I do it. n initial, I say, is always whatever, wherever the starting point or the initial point of the electron is, whatever orbit that is, and this is always the final. What does that result in? Well, uh, this could be, this quantity could be a positive or negative number, which I'm totally okay with. If n initial is a smaller number than n final, that'll always happen. Uh, and I'll explain more about why I'm okay with that a little bit later. However, your textbook or instructor or what have you uh, might not prefer my method but might be saying the n initial always has to be the smallest number and the n final always has to be the largest number regardless of where the electron starts or ends. That's totally fine and what that allows you to do is always keep this quantity positive. If you prefer that, that's not a problem. You're going to end up getting the same value if you take the absolute value of whatever answer you get from either method, really my method, you're going to get the same magnitude of the answer. The third so, and most contentious question I get is, should I use, why use the Rydberg when you could use the Balmer, or I guess vice versa, but I always use the Rydberg. Here's why. Let's t take a little bit of observation time, and you can see the differences. I have the Rydberg solve for different variables here on the left, and on the right, solve for those same variables plus one bonus equation on the right-hand side. It's pretty easy to see what the difference is. An initial is always two. <laughs> and you can see it in this fourth equation right there. Uh, so for the bomber, it ha always has an initial equal to two. That's because there's something called the bomber series, where the bomber series is where an electron will move from another orbit to the second orbit. So from five to two, four to two, or the third orbit to the second orbit. Any one of those, and that's called the bomber series, when one of the values, the smaller value, is always two. Uh, why do people learn this? You commonly learn the Balmer series in general chemistry. And the reason why I was trying to explain things about quantum chemistry and the atomic line spectra, and it's interesting because the Balmer series gives transitions which are in the visible light range, meaning you can see them, as opposed to light that you can't see. So you tend to focus on the Balmer equation, you might have learned one of these four, uh, in your class and people use that. Uh, which is all fine, 
here's a problem I have when I do questions in my class. In my class, occasionally, one of the orbits is 2, and then there's another orbit, but that doesn't always happen. I might have an orbits 3 and 5 transition, in which case I can't use the bomber series because it's locked down on uh, one of the ends being 2, the smaller one. And similarly, there's not just the bomber series where n is 2, there's the Lyman, uh, the Poshin, the Brockett, the Fun, the Humphreys, all kinds of series which have a locked number, here showing the smaller number, and there's other series as well, they're just not named. So there's all kinds of series you can learn. It, the equations would be slightly different in that this number would be locked down depending on which series you're working on. Why I like the Rydberg is it's more consistently the same all the time. I don't care what the initial and final orbit are. It could be 2, in the case of the bomber, but it might be something else. So this gives me a more general equation that works for, in fact, all of these line series. So I have one equation that I can focus on, whether it be this one, this one, or this one. And so that makes it nice and convenient. Also, uh, when you also remember that energy is h nu, or hc over lambda, you can pair that with the, uh, with the Rydberg equation as such. So you can set it equal, and this is in fact how you derive these other two equations. The same can be done for the Balmer series as well. So uh, because h is a constant and c is a constant, it's easily to interconvert, and you can try it out at home, and you should be able to get these constant depending on which one of these you solve for. Just to focus on one, I focus on the top one, because I often ask students to find the energy and or to find the frequency, and or to find the wavelength. And you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to know all of these and remember or look up all of these constants. You can just know one. It's easy to, relatively easy to remember, and then you can calculate all the other variables that you want from there. Now there might be an occasion where I have a question where I say, hey, we're going from the fifth to the second orbit. Let's do a calculation. I use this when you could easily use the Balmer equation. But that's just one small snapshot of the many kinds of calculations that I'll do. And so that's why it's not as consistent, not wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong, it's just not as consistent of an equation. I'm jumping back and forth between different equations. So even though I'm going from 5 to 2 and say I asked you the wavelength where you could use an equation like this, and it's totally fine, I prefer to use this because on the other, you know, 20 calculations that I'm going to do, where I have different orbits and different variables that I'm asking for, uh, I can stick with one equation, even though it might be a little bit more work on any of the other reason why I like the Rydberg. This is actually a change in en energy. I'll put a delta E there, because we're talking about an energy change from one orbit to another orbit, whether going up or down. And so the nice thing about this is, uh, let's say we're going from orbit 3 to 5, so we're going up in energy. Well, chemically, we know that to go up in orbit, we know that we have to put in energy, or energy must be absorbed into the system to jump up, say, from 3 to 5. So mathematically, when I calculate that, I should get a positive number. And this is a way for my chemical knowledge and mathematical knowledge to sync up. To do further calculations, of course, I only care about the magnitude of the change in energy, so I'll take the absolute value of it. Now, in that case, it would be a positive number, so it won't matter. But, let's say I was going, the electron is dropping from 5 to 3. Well, if it's dropping orbits, it's going to release uh, energy uh, in the form of light. In this case, not visible, but it could be visible. And when light is released, I know chemically that that should be a negative number. When I put that into my formula, going from 5 to 3, I'll actually calculate a negative value. And mathematically, that will confirm what I thought chemically, that uh, there's a release in energy. So it allows me, when I use this formula, to mesh up my chemical and mathematical uh, knowledge. 
take the absolute value of it, so then I could calculate the wavelength or the frequency, uh, which I prefer Rydberg, and specifically why I use the top one. Again, you probably uh, many times can save time on me if you have either all of these known or written down, or you want to look one of them up in particular, or if I happen to be doing a Balmer equation, if you know or memorize or want to look up any of these, yeah, for sure you can be faster. Uh, but know that it's just a small snapshot. 